do you want to quickly walk through the tactics in your longevity toolkit? And then from there, we can go into detail on each of them. Yeah. I mean, I think broadly speaking, there are five buckets of things that we have control over um, to, to impact all of these things we're talking about. So one, we just talked about exercise. I, and you can probably tell my bias is that that's the single most important one uh, for the most part. So um, the second in no particular order would be nutrition. So what you eat matters. Um, and, and we will talk about that, I'm sure, in more detail. Uh, the third one would be sleep. So, um, you know, the difference between sleeping well and not sleeping well has an enormous impact on your brain, uh, but also on your metabolic health, which then indirectly plays a great role in, in, in other diseases. Um, the fourth would be all of the sort of medications and supplements, drugs, anything that your doctor prescribes or that you can buy over the counter. Uh, and these are of, you know, varying degrees of efficacy. Some of them are incredibly dubious. Some of them can be life-saving, but again, all of those things we'd want to think about. And then the, the final bucket would be kind of all the tools that we would have at our disposal to improve our emotional health and well-being. So we've already touched a little bit about why exercise is important, but for people in this audience, how can they start to safely exercise while also managing physical limitations? It's hard to provide kind of a, a blanket statement on that because everybody's going to be different. Um, but I think it's safe to say that um, people are less fragile than they believe. And, you know, it's... I meet many people, for example, who who have back injuries and say, look, I have a back injury. I can't really do anything. And the reality of it is when, when, when you sort of probe a little bit further, what you realize is nothing tends to make their back hurt more than inactivity. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't remember who made the statement, but I, I, I loved it and I, I've paraphrased it or uh, plagiarized it many times. Sitting is to lower back pain what bourbon is to alcoholism. So, you know, and I think any of you whose back has hurt will, will probably think about that and go, you know, he's, he's kind of right. Like when my back hurts, sitting is the one thing I don't like to do. Or after, after a long drive, it hurts worse. Um, and, and, you know, for most people, actually being active makes them feel better. Now, let's be clear. There are certain activities, like if you have no cartilage left in your knee, more walking won't make you feel better. And so you've got, you know, you're going to have to see an orthopedic surgeon. They might need to do a knee replacement. But boy, I will tell you in this day and age in 2025, what can be done with a knee replacement, a hip replacement, even a shoulder replacement? I mean, these operations have come along so far and they have restored so much quality of life to individuals. So Every one of these cases has to be managed individually, but if you have a really good PT or rehab professional who knows what's fixable with more training or more conditioning versus, hey, this actually does need some medical attention, um, I think the, the aspiration should be, what can I do to get as active as possible? Moving from exercise into nutrition, we saw questions come through that different diets are being talked about and they aren't sure which one they should follow. So is there a diet that you think is best or does it depend on the individual? I don't think there's a diet that is best. I think there are principles that matter and everyone should find the diet that best allows them to adhere to the principles. So what are the principles? The principles are not to eat too much and not to eat too little. That sounds dumb, but it's just the reality of it. And I think everyone struggles with a different end of that spectrum, right? There are some people who just don't like to eat that much. They're like little birds. And as they get older, that becomes a huge problem. They are too frail. At the other end of the spectrum, you have people like me who like to eat too much. And we will spend most of our life fighting against the urge to eat too much. And that also becomes a problem as you get older because the heavier you are, the more weight you're putting on each and every one of those joints. And again, we're thinking about all these things that are working against us as we age, not to mention other complications that come from eating too much. But I would say that in an aging population, the most important thing I want to emphasize is getting enough protein. First of all, I just think for many people, it's kind of hard to get enough protein in. Even I have to pay attention to it. And I 
don't have a problem eating. But I need to be mindful of, hey, did I get enough protein? It's, for, it's really easy for me to get all the carbs in the world. Uh, it's not, you know, I don't have to go out of my way to eat more fat, but I do have to be cognizant of getting enough protein. And enough protein is a pretty big number, right? It's about one gram per pound of body weight. So I would challenge each of you to pay attention to, hey, if you weigh 150 pounds, are you getting 150 grams of protein a day? And I would, I would bet that especially for the women here, that's even harder. Now, if you fall a little bit short of that, it's okay. But if you're at half of that, you're really not getting the optimal amount of protein. And as we age, we develop something called anabolic resistance which means that it is harder and harder for our muscles to synthesize and grow new muscle cells with the given amount of amino acids, which are the building blocks in protein that we get by eating protein. And, and therefore we actually need more and more protein to overcome that. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about obesity. We talk a lot about osteoporosis and osteopenia, but there's another condition of aging called sarcopenia, which is the condition of uh, muscle loss. And that's, that's a huge problem. And there's really two ways to um, in concert, two ways to address that. One is consuming enough protein and the other is doing enough resistance training. So again, doesn't matter if you're a vegetarian, doesn't matter if you like a Mediterranean diet, doesn't matter if you like steak and potatoes. If you can adhere to those principles, that's going to make your life easier. Is it harder to adhere to those principles if you're a vegan? Yeah, it's a lot harder, but it's not impossible. I know lots of people who have, have done it. Um, but, you know, looking at a food tracking app in your phone is a great way to spend a week evaluating how many grams of protein you're getting. And I think you'll be surprised um, that for many of us, it's we're probably underdoing it. Now moving on to sleep. Um, sleep is something that you've written a lot of, a lot about, and you said that you didn't used to take it very seriously, but now you do take it very seriously. And that's true. He goes to bed at like eight every night. So why do you think it's so important? I think I'm up till nine these days. Um, yes, sleep is important. Uh, and you're right. I used to probably until 12 years ago, I think my mantra was I'll sleep when I'm dead. And I, um, you know, just would try to sleep as little as possible. Um, but, but the evidence are pretty overwhelming, especially for, for the, for, for both near term and long term function of the brain, that sleep is very important. Um, now, I think at your age, a couple of unique challenges emerge. I, again, I think most people, once they're over 65 or 70, they're not fighting the will to sleep because they want to be out partying all night. Um, it's, it's more that other things are getting in the way, right? So we know that as a person ages, they're, they're, they tend to sleep a little bit lighter and their sleep architecture tends to change a little bit. We also know that other things get in the way, especially for men, which is it gets harder and harder to make it through a night without having to get up to pee. And um, I mean, you know, I'm already at that stage where at least two out of the seven nights a week, if I am not mindful about when I had my last glass of water, I'm going to be up at two or three in the morning to pee. And sometimes that's harder to go back to bed after. So, um, what are the things that we have under our control? Well, one of them is absolutely timing of water. Um, now, again, water is super important. The older a person gets, the more susceptible they are to dehydration. The older a person gets, the less reliable thirst is as an indicator for fluid status. So at Olivia's age, you don't really, believe it or not, need to pay attention to how much you're drinking. Thirst will be the guide. But that becomes less and less true as you age. So so you're you're juggling a narrow problem, which is on the one hand, you have to be mindful about drinking enough, but on the other hand, you can't drink too much too close to bed, and that's going to keep you awake. Another thing that makes a huge difference in sleep quality is timing of food. Um, so the longer you can have between when you have dinner and when you go to bed, the better. Um, so we eat dinner really early because we have young kids in our house, and that's why I can get away with going to bed at nine because it's still been three and a half hours or three hours since I since I ate. Another thing is alcohol. So some of you probably drink alcohol and the less alcohol you have in your system when you sleep, the better you're going to sleep. 
having a super dark room, having a super cold room is going to make a big difference. And perhaps the biggest thing to, to um, sort of uh, make, make a point about here is consistency of timing, especially on the wake up. So if you could tether yourself to one time, it's what time do I wake up? And if you force yourself to wake up at the same time every day and don't allow yourself to take a nap during the day, and this is a big ask because I know naps can be tempting, it's going to regulate when you end up going to bed by building up enough sleep pressure. So if a person tells me I'm struggling to sleep at night and I find out they're napping during the day, the first thing I want to do is get rid of the nap, right? I want them to, and then I, and then I want to, I want to fix the wake up time, eliminate the nap, and then actually let them get into um, a, a better sleep cycle that way. Are there any good sleep supplements that you recommend taking and that are like not damaging to you? Yeah, there are. I mean, and I think one has to be very careful with this stuff. Um, we, you know, there's certainly evidence to suggest that as we age, melatonin levels go down and therefore melatonin can aid at least with sleep initiation. But it's important to know that melatonin really is only the signal to initiate sleep. It's not going to necessarily keep you asleep all night. So if you're not doing all of the other things correctly, melatonin is is going to be limited in its in its efficacy. So uh, before I go down the route of supplements, I want to get everything we just talked about vis-a-vis -vis the hygiene completely dialed in. And then yeah, if there's still an issue falling asleep, I think melatonin can be can be a viable tool, although I I'd, I'd really want to make sure it's the lowest dose you can buy. They tend to sell this stuff in high enough doses to kill horses. It's not necessary. You know, the the sm the lowest dose, which is maybe 300 micrograms is is probably all you need at most twice that dose, but you don't need anything north of a milligram. Um I think one has to experiment a little bit with other things. I find ashwagandha a little bit helpful for others maybe not so much. Okay, and then we'll quickly touch on the last one, which is emotional health. And a lot of people think that this is not really something that kind of matters in longevity, but you talked about this in the last chapter of Outlive and how it's really important to you and that you've recently discovered it. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and how it's important as people are aging? Well, I, I think it's actually important at any age. And I think that... Um you know what i what i imagine is so appealing about living at a place like this is you have a built-in system of friendship and i would imagine that that's probably a great source of well-being that that many of your peers would be missing out on if they were living alone um you know i think about how little i see my parents because we live in a different country um and so i can imagine that things that we take for granted when we're young like being close to our children or our grandchildren aren't guaranteed when we grow older uh now of course she's signed a contract that says she can't leave austin so this won't be a problem for me but um uh you know i i think I think social a, a social support network and and some sense of purpose might be the single most important part of um of 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 the emotional health toolkit as it pertains to to living longer. Uh, every one of us knows the story of the couple that have been married for seventy years. Uh, one of them passes away, and then the other one is, is has you know dies within a year. Uh, I I don't think these are I don't think these are just anecdotal. I, I really think there's there's an understanding of why that happens. So you can do everything right. You can eat the right diet. You can sleep right. You can exercise. But if your emotional health is lacking, then it's like you won't live as long. It's possible, but I, th I would say even more than that. Regardless of how long you live, if it's if it's unhappy, why bother? You know what I mean? Like I. I so, so let's say you, let's say you do live a long time, but you're alone or you're miserable. Uh, in in some ways, that would be the ultimate purgatory.